Coming up on Market to Market. USDA's latest estimates on supply and demand are friendly to corn and soybeans. Persistent drought is plaguing the West, and now a new problem is blowing into town. And we'll examine the increasing role of technology at the world's largest futures exchange. Those stories and market analysis with Darren Newsom next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, April 11 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. The government reported Friday that the prices companies received for their goods and services rose significantly last month, paced by strong gains in food. The producer price index, which measures inflation at the wholesale level, rose half a percent in March, paced by a 30 percent gain in hog prices and a 12 percent spike in the cost of poultry. Those increases, however, were partially offset by a 2 percent decline in gasoline prices and a 7 tenths of 1 percent drop in electricity costs. Stripping out the volatile food and energy sectors, so-called core prices ticked up a modest 3 tenths of 1 percent. And overall inflation remains relatively tame as producer prices have risen just 1.4 percent over the past year. Of greater concern, perhaps, to those producing agricultural commodities are more fundamental economic principles. And that was brought home poignantly again this week when USDA released its latest estimates on global supply and demand. The report was welcomed by corn producers. Noting already strong export numbers, USDA increased its corn export estimates by 125 million bushels over last month's guess. Global corn production estimates were also raised 6.4 million tons, with about a third of the gain attributed to Brazil. After weighing all the data, government analysts predicted a season average corn price of $4.60 per bushel, up 2% from last month's guesstimate. The latest estimates were also friendly to soybeans. Despite relatively high domestic prices and record harvest in South America, U.S. exports have remained strong especially to China, where shipments have already exceeded the previous all-time high. Based on record year-to-date shipments, total U.S. soybean exports were increased 3% to 1.6 billion bushels. Global soybean production is pegged at 284 million tons. That's down slightly from last month's estimate, but if realized, it would still be a record high. Nevertheless, USDA raised the season average soybean price modestly to $13 per bushel. USDA's latest supply and demand estimates were not as bullish for wheat prices. The agency's outlook for wheat revealed a 30 million bushel decline in feed usage and lower global consumption by 2.4 million tons. Despite a modest reduction in world production, global wheat supplies are expected to be half a million tons higher. Still, the projected season average farm price for all wheat was unchanged at $6.85 per bushel. Based on the Agriculture Department's Cotton Ginnings report released late last month, U.S. cotton production estimates were reduced about 2.5% to 12.9 million bales. Domestic ending stocks were reduced to 2.5 million bales, which is the smallest supply since 1951. Despite slumping production and tight supplies, the USDA increased its marketing year average price by just one penny to $77.50 per hundredweight. And milk production is forecast to rise this year as record prices prompt dairy producers to expand their herds. Nevertheless, USDA increased its season average price for all milk to $22.80 per hundredweight. As temperatures climb across the southwest, researchers have found some species will win, but others stand to lose. The U.S. Geological Survey and researchers from the universities of New Mexico and northern Arizona released a report this week examining the effects of climate change on species such as the desert tortoise and the pinyon jay. According to the research, the jay stands to lose nearly one-third of its breeding range, 
while the tortoise is the only reptile studied that isn't projected to see a decrease in suitable habitat. But the prolonged drought is also having a major impact on certain species of plants. And now, in a scene reminiscent of a John Wayne movie, a bunch of unwanted desperados are riding into western towns. An icon of the American West is returning with a vengeance. Several years of drought have made tumbleweeds a thorn in the side of cowboy country. Russian thistle and kochia from Europe and parts of Asia took hold last year on parched ground in Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Colorado. Uprooted by a November freeze, the invasive rolling weeds are gunning for a showdown with ranchers and homeowners alike. Looked like sheep running across a prairie because the whole prairie was alive. As multiple plants spin along the ground, scattering seed, further headaches are all but assured. And irrigation ditches, along with several miles of road, have been smothered by the twisted foliage. We plowed weeds with road graders, trucks, loaders, the trucks. It'll come over the cab and you can't see anything. High winds south of Colorado Springs have swept clusters of the breezy flora into suburbs, where they pile up and threaten to choke residents off from the outside world. Uh, I had a couple delivery people call the house saying they couldn't get to the front door because the front door was blocked. Typically, cattle grazing keeps rangeland overgrowth to a minimum. But lingering dry conditions have forced many livestock owners to cut back or even sell their herds. And that has allowed tumbleweeds to flourish. A look at this week's drought monitor from the University of Nebraska shows patches of severe, extreme, and exceptional drought throughout the areas plagued by the wind-blown menace. And with wildfire season just around the corner, these piles of kindling are sparking the concerns of local officials. Once you get the first wave beat down and packed down and out of the road, the wind comes up and here comes the next batch. The National Interagency Fire Center's outlook for April 2014 shifts above normal wildfire projections to several plain states and California. But county governments are hopeful that state and federal aid will alleviate the tumbleweed emergency and thus the threat of inferno to Colorado and elsewhere. In the meantime, some of the same pioneering spirit that helped tame the West has blown into town as Crowley County has fashioned a makeshift tumbleweed whacker from odd parts of farm equipment. Longtime viewers of this program know that we always quote futures prices on market to market. While our discussions also explore ramifications for cash marketers, the bulk of our analysis rise, relies on data from futures exchanges in Chicago. Since 1848, open outcry was the only method of trading at the Chicago Board of Trade, or CBOT. With arms flailing and voices blaring, frenzied traders haggled over prices, and orders were filled with a few hand signals, a nod, or even a shout. But things changed dramatically in 2007 when the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the Chicago Board of Trade merged to form the CME Group, the world's largest and most diverse trading exchange. Computerized transactions soon emerged as the dominant method of trading. But even in today's modern markets, there are still guys in rather colorful jackets doing business the old-fashioned way. David Miller explains. Shouts can still be heard on the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade at 141 West Jackson, but nothing in comparison to the cacophony of the past. Most of the open outcry trading has left the futures ring and now takes place in the options pit. The rest of the action at the world's oldest futures exchange has been reduced to a little more than a mouse click. It used to be an advantage when we had all the open outcry transparency held down here where we could see the information and we had the knowledge. But now sometimes things happen and there's much more information floating around electronically where we're the fly on the windscreen per se. <laughs> you know, we're the last guy to know. March 434, 21 by two foot spread. Scott Shelledy has been a commodities trader for more than 25 years. A second generation floor trader, Shelledy owns one of the 3,600 seats or memberships on the CBOT, allowing him to trade on the floor. Memberships come with various trading rights on the exchange, but only 1,400 are considered to be full seats. The price of a seat hit an all-time high of $3.2 million in 2006, 
but prices have declined 92% over the past eight years to $265,000. And Shelady says the reasons for owning a seat have changed dramatically. Maybe for actually trading uh, costs at the exchange level, it's an advantage. We trade at a cheaper price as far as a tax that we pay the exchange. But other than that, where it used to be something as an advantage for information, it's not anymore. These days, Shelody does nearly all of his business electronically, which allows him to trade more than just agricultural commodities. However, he does note the advantages and disadvantages of both spending time in a desk chair and shouting in the trading pits. Because the customers want both things. They want trade certainty. Am I filled? Am I filled? Am I done? Am I done? Have I done the actual, you know, has my broker executed what I want them to do? And I want to know yesterday. But at the same time, they want to know what everybody else is doing. So if I do that in the open outcry market, I can tell them what everybody else is doing, or I can tell them upstairs electronically, yes, you're done, you're filled, I've done what you wanted me to do. Well, who else is doing what I want to do? I don't know, I just put it into a machine. So for speed, you lose, speed is less transparent. Slower is more transparent. So we can all see what everybody's doing a little slower and disseminate that information or we can do it really fast upstairs and nobody knows what anybody's doing. The first electronic trades were made in 1992 on the CME Globex trading platform. Use of the program was limited by computing power and bandwidth. Today, those hurdles have largely been overcome, making it possible to buy and sell anywhere a data connection is available. According to the CME Group, more than 90% of agricultural futures and nearly 55% of agricultural options transactions are no longer executed in the commodity pits. The trend can be seen across the entire exchange as the number of people in the grain and livestock rings diminishes. But as the number of people trading on the floor has declined, the number of opportunities to make trades has increased. In April of last year, the 165-year-old exchange combined the traditional four hours of open outcry with 17 hours of simultaneous electronic trading. The new hours allowed the CBOT and CME to reach a volume of more than 265 million futures and options contracts in 2013. This is down 8% from the heavily drought-influenced record trading year of 2012. I can remember after the, after the close of the grains and any given day, you could go downstairs to the bar or up to your office and sit around and talking about corn, soybeans, and wheat for a couple hours, just you know, soaking up knowledge and comparing notes. You can't really do that anymore. I think that that's been the big loss. And uh, I'm sorry to see that part of it go. And on the one side, I can get quicker and better and cleaner executions for, for myself and my customers. But on the other side, uh, I've lost access to a lot of knowledge that's very, very hard to replace. Jack Scoville began as a runner on the Chicago Board of Trade in 1981 and worked his way up to being a floor trader. Scoville left the trading ring in 1990 and has been trading electronically for the Price Futures Group since 1992. Uh, the open outcry is, is a lot more fun, uh, a lot more action, a lot of excitement that you don't really get sitting here in an office, but we can trade with much more certainty. When we get filled price, we know it's a filled price. While Scoville laments the loss of comradeship in the trading ring, he does point up the advantages of the new trading landscape. I can remember 30 years ago when I was having to call Brazil for the company I was working at at the time, and it could take me a half hour to get a phone line. And then I'd have to try and keep it open all day long. Now I can just call the guys up from wherever I am around the world. I can tell you that I've spent uh, time riding in the back seats of uh, pickup trucks in Central America, passing orders from Brazil to Chicago for my clients. The CME Globex electronic trading platform also allows for some traders to make a large number of trades in millionths of a second. CME officials have yet to break out how much of the trading volume is made via the practice of high-frequency trading, and they are quick to point out that the most important thing is the integrity of their markets for each and every participant. How and where all the information is gathered and used has changed. 
In the past, floor traders reacted to the peaks and valleys of various trading cycles. They would often trade in ways that are sensitive to harvest lows, weather trends, and key government reports. But with all the information readily available on the internet, tech-savvy traders can shift the market in unexpected directions. So there may be a trader in India that doesn't know about those cycles. And so they'll trade against them. If you have enough people doing a one-lot trade, that can be a big trade. And if it just so happens they all do it at the same time, you might see there's rain on the horizon for corn. Corn prices should be going down, but enough people have bought a one-lot from somewhere else in the world that the market's rallying. So we have to be careful about what's actually happening, slowly but surely somehow take the noise out. And as more and more commodities on the CME group are traded electronically, Shelledy believes it's important to balance knowledge and experience against the pressure of changing times. You could shoot a cannon through here and not hit anybody. So yeah, it's, uh, it's nowhere near what it used to be. And ultimately, that's not the exchange to decide or the traders to decide. The customer will decide when and if he or she wants to do the business 100% electronically. But right now, there's enough customers that do call people and we execute in the pit. So as long as that's the same, it'll still stay open. For Market to Market, I'm David Miller. Next, the Market to Market Report. Grain futures contracts traded modestly lower this week in the wake of USDA's supply and demand estimates. For the week, May wheat lost four cents, while the nearby corn contract moved three cents lower. Soybeans gave back some of last week's rally as the May contract lost 11 cents. Nearby meal followed suit with the decline of $6.20 per ton. In the softs, cotton's rally ran out of steam this week as the May contract lost $3.38 per hundredweight. In the dairy market, April Class 3 milk gained 4 cents, while the deferred contract lost 56 cents per hundred. Livestock prices continued their run in record territory as the June cattle contract gained 97 cents. Nearby feeders advanced by $1.55, and the June lean hog contract bounced back from last week's loss with a gain of 67 cents. In the financials, the euro gained 20 basis points against the dollar. Crude oil rose $2.60 per barrel. Comex Gold gained $15.50 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index advanced by more than 7 points to settle at 652.65. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Darren Newsom. Welcome back. Good to be back, Mike. We did have the USDA uh, World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates Report come out this week. Give us your breakdown. We heard the numbers earlier in the show. How do they affect, let's talk, wheat market first? Wheat market, if we're just going to... If we're going to take a look at what USDA released this week, you'd probably say that the the numbers were bearish for wheat. They increased domestic ending stocks. They increased global ending stocks. The interest in those numbers, as far as wheat goes, lasted maybe 10 seconds, could have been closer to five, uh, before the attention turned back to the weather. I mean, numbers are fine. But right now, the focus is on how dry and how cold it was over much of the Southern Plains uh, this past winter. And, you know, the anticipation on Monday that was delayed uh, till Tuesday for the initial crop condition report uh, you know, for the winter wheat crop. And as we take a look at the wheat market, understanding that there, there is still a tough situation mm-hmm. as we look at the ongoing drought, um, probably selling opportunities here in the future as we sort through what all's how this how everything well, emerged from the winter yeah the problem is you know if if producers if winter wheat producers used the winter rally or the rally that we've seen say up till the last couple of weeks if they use that to get some forward contracting done now given the dry conditions the the pork crop conditions as it comes out of dormancy they're not going to really be able to sit back and do much more selling until they see what the crop is. I'm going to guess most of them have 30, maybe 40 percent of their crop forward contracted on the last rally. There's really no way to go much beyond that right now because 30 percent can turn into well over 100 percent in the blink of an eye. So I would say markets pulling back July Kansas City wheat's testing the technical price support around 729 and a half. Probably stagnate there for a little while. Monday will come back in. It won't rain over the weekends. It'll go back up. But producers probably aren't going to be able to take advantage of it that like they'd like to. All right. Well, now let's jump over to the corn market. After the report, we did see a bit of a bump both mm-hmm. on old crop and new crop corn numbers, and then it fizzled out a little mm-hmm. bit. Talk to us where we're seeing in the old crop corn market. Well, it fizzled out because nobody believes the numbers anyway. Uh, 
ending stocks were lowered to 1.331 billion bushels. We increased exports by 125 million bushels, despite the fact that all we're hearing is because of the GMO fight, China's going to really shut down on, on uh, U.S. Import, imports from the United States. Uh, even before the report, uh, with the previous export demand projection, we were still running 5 6% behind uh, on total shipments. After the report, uh, and then we get the next weekly shipments report out on Thursday, now we're running 8% behind. So it is unlikely, it is unlikely that we meet this new 1.75 billion bushels, meaning that ending stocks probably closer to the 1.45, 1.475 billion rather than the 1.3. So that's why the market really wasn't able to push up and explode higher. Nobody believes the numbers. All right. Now, on the new crop side, mm -hmm. we heard the numbers from the USDA. Uh, we heard the still digesting the acre numbers. Producers should just wait for a weather event to push this a little bit higher. Yeah, you know, it, it's early. Uh, you know, we, we've got the December contract testing resistance in the low fives. I think it's like 503, 504 for the technical resistance in, in these corn. Seasonally, it does tend to move up. Again, we're just in April. Uh, we haven't been able to get into the fields. But if it warms up, if it starts to warm up across the Midwest and the planters start to roll, the U.S. has shown it can plant a lot of corn in a hurry. And if the prices, you know, are, are relatively favorable, they can still switch... Uh, they can still change their mind somewhat from planting soybeans to corn. So we don't know what acres are. I mean, it was a nice guess by USDA uh, in its prospective planning report, but it's just that. Uh, they don't know. We'll find out later what was – or we, theoretically, we'll find out later what was actually planted. Uh, we'll, again, we'll never know for sure. But market right now seems to be sitting back waiting to see what develops. All right. Now let's take a look at the soybean market. Again, we saw a bit of an impact mm -hmm. from the USDA report and then on the old crop side really seemed to fall apart mm -hmm. towards the end of the week. Yeah, and again, to me, it had nothing to do with USDA because the numbers are wrong. Uh, they came in at 135 million bushels ending stocks uh, domestically. They trimmed global ending stocks down below 70 million metric tons. Um, the, the, the fact is they had to change. USDA changed almost every category of supply and demand in its table to maintain some sort of reasonable ending stocks figure, letting the ending stocks use kind of slip under the radar, dropping to a record low 4%. Now, we're on an incredible pace still. We've been on an incredible pace for U.S. exports. Uh, the inverse in the future spreads, particularly the May-July, has been very strong for months and months and months. But what we're seeing now as this week came to a close, and even somewhat last week uh, towards the end of the week, is that inverse is starting to weaken. There's something going on fundamentally where, yes, we are tighter than the 135 million bushels. That's granted. We know that. Uh, but something's going on fundamentally. Either there's some cancellations occurring uh, or as there's been talk of China sending some ships back because of credit problems. Something's going on on the, on the fundamental side that we won't see the headlines now for a while that's changing the structure of this market. And the weaker uh, or, or the less bullish this, these spreads get, the more pressure we could see starting to come from the investment side, the fund side, as they start selling some of their positions. All right. Well, now let's take a look at the livestock market. So we did see the June cattle uh, come up a little bit this mm -hmm. week. We still haven't seen April quite catch up to mm -hmm. cash. Where are we headed on the fat cattle side? Well, you know, as we look at, you know, we talk about spreads a lot. Uh, as we look at the June-August spreads, uh, you know, it's still very bullish. There's still a very tight supply and demand situation. So we saw a little bit of a dip down. We've got technical signals galore saying that cattle should be going down. But one thing that's always been fun about trading the cattle or watching the cattle or analyzing the cattle market is that they don't care about charts. It's a cash-driven market, and as long as the cash market remains strong, you're not going to be able to break the futures for very long. You'll see a couple weeks down, but it'll come roaring back, and I still believe that's where the cash cattle market is. That's where the live cattle futures are. Look for the June contract to continue to run. April's you know, really losing some steam in here because it's getting close to going off, uh, but June cattle should continue to run. All right, and if June cattle continues to run, corn doesn't hit any new highs, we should probably see con feeders continue to stay strong. I would say so. You know, if, if, if the corn market has kind of hit a little plateau in here until we get something to move the market, I would say feeders, same situation, tried to back off, really couldn't break the market. Now, if the live cattle are able to go up, I would think feeders will be able to follow along. All right. Well, now let's take a look at the hog market. <laughs> we did see after last week's $9 sell-off a bit of a bump this week, 67 cents. What happened? <laughs> if you could tell me, that would be great. Uh, the hog market has become the new pork bellies. It, it's completely irrational. Uh, we'll see 2 to $3 move one day going up. 
another two to three dollars going down the next day. Exactly what you know for all those of us who are old enough to remember how pork bellies used to trade. It's exactly what's happening now. I don't know if it's a it's a lack of liquidity, if it's fear over the fundamental side of the market, if funds are just getting used to trading hogs. Uh, it's kind of a new market. They got into cattle, now they're getting into hogs more. Uh, but there's a lot of things going on, and really, it's a market that defies logic at this point. So. If you're going to trade he- ca- ca- excuse me, hogs, you have to do so very carefully. If you're a producer, you have to pick your spots. Uh, fundamentally, they're still bullish. June, August spread, still bullish, uh, showing a tight supply and demand situation. So use that as a guide. Price accordingly, uh, but be very careful with this market. Now, you mentioned we st- we're still seeing bullish spreads. Is the enthusiasm for those bullish spreads still tied to the PED? Is that still the main driver in the hog markets? I think so. Um, you know, and, and to me, if it was just the headlines, that would be, that would be the non-commercial side. That that'd be the fund side. That would be the investors trying to play the latest piece of news. But the actual spreads themselves are indicating that that those who are on the commercial side, those who trade the cash hogs, are still concerned now out into the summer about about the supply of hogs to meet demand. Could this come to an end? Sure. I mean, once we work our way through spring, early summer, maybe this starts to come to an end. But for right now, we're not seeing it. We're still seeing good strength in that spread. Seeing good strength, and we're still seeing consumers willing to pay the record high uh, lean hog cutoff. We are. I mean, both, the, again, going back to cash, uh, the cash cattle market, cash hogs, very strong market, still solid demand. We're just, you know, Hopefully, coming into spring, not far away from full, you know, full-out grilling season, I think that's going to keep, you know, keep some support underneath these cash markets. And as you say, there's probably not going to see a, a lot of rain this weekend. <laughs> no. Some warmer temperatures might see some grills fired up. Uh, very possible. Very we'll see possible. how that affects the cash markets come that's next right. week. Well, Darren, really appreciate you taking the time to be with us this weekend. Well, thanks again for having me on. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Darren and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our Market Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed, Facebook page, and the rest of our social media outlets exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we'll learn how one military veteran is embarking on a new mission as a beginning farmer. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.